Check, check, check. Well, hey there, everybody. We're going to try this again. Hopefully, the sound's a, a little bit better this time. Uh, I think I have fixed my mistakes, so I apologize to everybody who was trying to watch class uh, on Wednesday. Um, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll redouble my efforts to make sure this goes well with the, with the audio. Uh, we, uh, last week, we got pretty close to finishing up Amos, there, there were a couple of things that I wanted to, uh, to just mention uh, that we didn't get to the, the previous week, so I thought I would go ahead and, uh, and do that. The, um, obviously, I'm going to be uh, just kind of more talking straight through instead of asking questions or, or looking for, for discussion here this time around since I'm uh, just recording this, but um, if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to, to email me or uh, shoot me a text or, or give me a call, and uh, we can uh, I'll see do my best to try to answer some of those. Um, so let's uh, let's get back into Amos just for just for a minute. Uh, Amos chapter four, verses eight through twelve. There's there's three things in particular here that. I wanted to point out and just call your call your attention to. Um, uh, actually, chapter four, six through twelve is is where we're going to go. So, if you got your Bible, go ahead and open up there with me, and let's read together. It says, "I give you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you did not return to me," declares the Lord. Uh, cleanness of teeth, by the way. Uh, if you think about the things that make your teeth dirty, uh, it's when you eat food and put things uh, in, in your mouth, especially sugars and different things. So cleanness of teeth would be would mean that they're, they don't have any food to eat. So um, that's what he's referring to there. Uh, verse seven: I also withheld the rain from you when you were when when there were yet three months to the harvest. I would send rain on one city, send no rain on another city. One field would have rain, and the field on which it did not rain would wither. So two or three cities would wander to another city to drink water and would not be satisfied. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Struck you with blight and mildew, your many gardens and your vineyards, your fig trees, your olive trees, the locusts were devoured, yet you did not return to me. I sent among you a pestilence after the manner of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword and carried away your horses. And I made the stench of your camp go up into your nostrils, yet you did not return to me. I overthrew some of you as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were as a brand plucked out of the burning, yet you did not return to me. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. So the, the point that I want to make here, uh, we read through Amos, and so much of it just seems so drastic and so terrible. And if you're like me, you probably read through some of it, and, and you're thinking, God, please just give him another chance. Like, like we see Amos saying in, in chapter 7. But... God has been trying to get their attention for a very, very long period of time. We see that here. We see that he, he's done all sorts of things to try to get their attention. And he's told them that that's what he was trying to do. He was trying to get their attention by, by bringing these things 
their way. So what I, what I want to say about that is that God has been trying to get their attention for a very long time, and his people have continually turned their backs on him. That's why they're in the situation that they're in. And, and it's not just bad things like like are listed here that God's done to try to get their attention. He's done the opposite as well. He's lavished all sorts of wonderful and amazing things on them, and yet they, they did, still didn't recognize God. They still didn't turn toward him. They still turned their backs on him and wanted to do, do life as if he didn't exist in some ways. So uh, this, is, this is not something that God comes to lightly. Uh, Let's flip to chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Let me point something out here. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It's darkness, it's not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. It's not the, is it not, is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? So there's, there is, uh, there's a lot of things out there about the day of the Lord. You're going to see that come up in several, uh, several of the prophets that we'll be looking at this semester. Uh, Isaiah, uh, Joel, Daniel, some others. And what I want to say about the day of the Lord is that sometimes people hear this and they, they read this and they think, Oh, we're talking about the, the final judgment, the end of times, the, the time when God is going to judge the entire earth, uh, something along those lines. And that's not actually what's, what's being talked about here. The day of the Lord is simply a particular point in time in a particular place for a particular people where he is going to bring judgment. So uh, for Amos, for Israel... Uh, the things that Amos is talking about that are going to happen to Israel when uh, the, the, the day of the Lord for them was, was in 722 B.C. when Assyria comes in and, and basically wipes them out. Uh, the day that God brought judgment for a particular people in a particular time in a particular place. And we see God do this with Israel. We see him do it with Judah. We, we see him do it with Assyria uh, and, and some other other nations as well. So uh, I just want to caution you not to be too forward thinking when we talk about the day of the Lord here. And of course, you know, depending on whether you you're, have turned your back on God or not, uh, the day of the Lord can be a, a very different kind of thing. And for Israel, uh, they're thinking, oh, God's going to come and he's going to judge all these other nations like we talked about in chapters 1 and 2. Yeah, God, go get them. But what they don't realize is that the day of the Lord is coming for them and that they are on the wrong side of the coin. Uh, they're going to be judged as well. And being underneath the judgment of God is not a, not a happy place. It's not a good place to be. Uh, one, more, one more thing I wanted to look at, chapter 6 verses 1 through 7, and I, I won't read all of this, but, uh, but I just wanted to, to point this out also. It says, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. Skip down, and again he says in verse 4, Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches. Uh, people who are living it up um, and just spending their days relaxing and not caring about what's going on around them. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he explains what uh, the, the people upon whom woe will be visited, but I, I want to talk about the woe oracle just for a moment. So this is, this is an, uh, sort of a prophetic formula. It's common in, in several of the prophets. They, they use it often. Uh, Jesus even uses a war oracle in, uh, a woe oracle in Matthew chapter 23. Woe to you, Pharisees. And he does it seven times in Matthew chapter 23. And what he's doing there is following a uh, particular type of prophetic speech called a woe oracle. If you think about uh, a small town, a real, really small town, and you hear 
on a Saturday, say around uh, 11 o'clock, you hear uh, a bell in a church tower start ringing. Uh, oftentimes, what that means if you're in a small town is that there's a funeral about to happen. And there's a, there's a poem called For Whom the Bell Tolls that, that talks about this, uh, the, the ringing of the church bell, uh, announcing that, that uh, someone's life is about to be cele- celebrated or that there's going to be a funeral or a memorial service. Um, so that bell would, would signify that something like that was, was going on. Well, for an Israelite back in the time of Amos, uh, a woe was a particular word or sound that was associated with funerals, kind of like a, a church bell ringing on a Saturday in a, in a small town. Uh, it, uh, it sounds kind of like, oh, and it's a, it is a sound of mourning. It's a sound that people would make when, when someone died. It's a sound that they would make when they were mourning on behalf of someone who they had lost. So when a prophet pronounces a woe on a particular people, what he's, what he's doing is he's basically announcing their funeral. Uh, so you can almost see this as uh, hearing your eulogy ahead of time or uh, having your obituary read to you while you're, while you're still alive. They're still alive, but he, he's basically saying you're as good as dead. That would be particularly chilling, very, very chilling. Uh, so I, I just wanted to point those things out. You'll, you'll see woes, uh, woe oracles used a couple more times in some of the prophets that we'll, that we'll be looking at. Let's go ahead and flip over to Hosea. We're going to get into Hosea today. Not quite going to, not quite going to finish, but we will uh, get a little bit in here. We'll do a little bit of an intro and give you some background. Uh, so Hosea, he he started prophesying about five years or so after Amos, about 755 BC or so, and. Um, not much later than that, because uh, part of his ministry, it, it happened while things were still decent in Israel. Um, so we talked about Jeroboam, and Hosea prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam, but then also some, some kings after that who we'll talk about in a moment. But, uh, you know, things under Jeroboam, they were, they were really, really good. They, they, their kingdom was prosperous. There was... Uh, the economics were good, the, the borders were expanded, and they were secure. They weren't, weren't particularly worried about nations coming in to try to go to war with them. Um, uh, things were good for, for some people, of course. Obviously, there were others who were being mistreated, and things were, were bad for them. But uh, overall, Israel was in a, a, a pretty good place uh, politically, militarily, uh, financially, those kinds of things. Um, but as soon as Jeroboam goes away, the, the bottom kind of falls out in, in Israel and things start to get kind of crazy. There's no more good life. There's nobody living up on the hills in their summer houses or in their winter houses. Uh, there, there's none of that. The, the prosperity, the wealth, the, the ease of life, they sort of disappear when, Je- with, when Jeroboam goes away. Uh, so like Amos... Hosea was a, a prophet to the northern kingdom, to Israel. He, he's actually going to refer to Israel by uh, four different names. He's going to call it Israel. He's going to say Samaria. He's going to say Jacob. And he's going to say Ephraim. So uh, don't, don't be confused when you hear those terms. They're, they're all synonyms. They're all talking about the northern kingdom. They're all talking about Israel. Uh, they just, when he uses them, they might recall a little bit of different history or have a little bit of a different tone to them, uh, but, the, but he's, he's talking about the, the same thing. So he was a prophet to the northern kingdom, to Israel. Uh, he kind of jumps around a lot. You know, we talked about how if you, if you sit down and try to read the prophets, like, chronologically, then you're going to kind of be lost and in trouble. Well, Hosea is very much that way. This is, this is a collection of speeches that 
<coughs> that Hosea would have given, or that Hosea did give, and uh, he or someone else has taken them and compiled them and, and put them all together, and they haven't necessarily done so in a chronological order, but they've, they've done so to, uh, to achieve the messages that they're trying to, to ha have people hear, to achieve some purposes that, uh, that they want to accomplish for the people who will be reading these speeches that have been written down. So um, you, it's even kind of hard to tell sometimes in Hosea when one speech ends and another one begins. But, but you can tell a little bit um, by when you're reading, depending on how he describes the situation in Israel. Like if everybody is at ease and things are going well, then, then it's probably earlier on in his uh, prophesying and his ministry to Israel. Uh, but if, if things are bad, things are starting to fall apart a little bit, and he's explaining that, then it's probably later on after Jeroboam is uh, overtaken. So if you think of if you think of Israel as like this this big ship on on a sea, when Amos prophesied just a little bit before Hosea, you can picture this ship. It's it's approaching this rocky coast. The sea is really, really, really rough, and uh, Amos is sort of like this, this lighthouse up on top of the hill um, saying, watch out, watch out, watch out. There's danger ahead if you continue to go the direction that you're going. Well, but, but Israel, the ship, they're, and they're, let's say there are people on this ship, and um, they're just kind of partying it up. They're not paying attention to the lighthouse. They're not paying attention to... Uh, the rough seas or the rocky water that, that they're about to embark on, uh, they're sort of in a scary place and nobody, nobody really knows it, or, or maybe they know it a little bit, but they just don't really care. So um, when Hosea starts, this, this ship is about to hit the rocks and then pretty, pretty quickly into Hosea's uh, prophesying, into his ministry, the ship hits the rocks and water starts to pour in. Uh, people at this point, they're still kind of partying and having a good time and not paying attention and nobody's really caring what's going on. But then at some point the water starts to seep up all through the holes and they start to feel the water around their ankles and around their knees and they, they realize that they're in this, this sinking ship and then they start to get scared. But but by that point in time, it's too late. The, the ship is sunk. There's nothing that they can do about it. Too much damage. They can't bail out the water fast enough. And, and by the time uh, Hosea ends, the, the ship has completely and totally sunk, and Assyria has come in and, and wiped out Israel. So uh, this is kind of kind of where Israel is during the time of these, these two prophets. Um, let's, let's take a look at some of the, at the kings that, that of Israel who were king as, as Hosea prophesied. And, and by the way, if you have a little bit of extra free time, I know that's <laughs> extra free time, what's that? Uh, but if you do happen to have a little bit of extra free time, if, if you were to, to just read from about 1 Kings 12, to the end of Second Kings, it would do you well uh, as you read through Hosea and some of these other prophets because they're going to refer to particular historical events that are going on with Israel and, and, and nations around them. Uh, and uh, we miss some of those references if, if it's not fresh in our mind, some of the things that have been happening in, in uh, First Kings and, and Second Kings. So Hosea is going to have several references like that. And, and if, you're, if you read through that material, it would be a little more fresh and you might recognize some stuff that you wouldn't otherwise. Uh, so some of these kings, so Jeroboam II, we, we start with him, of course. He, he had a, a really long reign. He was a, a big-time military leader, uh, secured the borders. Things were, things were looking really good for Israel when he was king. But then... But then he dies, and Zechariah, he becomes king for a whole six months before he's assassinated by Menahem, I mean by Shalom, I'm sorry. 
And then Shalom, he's king after that for a whole one month before being assassinated by Menahem. Uh, Menahem, he's king for about seven years until his son Pekahiah takes over. Uh, and he, he was the first one to not be assassinated after a couple of kings there. Um, and then Pekahiah, he's king for two years. And again, he's assassinated by Pekah. And then Pekah is king for about five years. And then he's assassinated. I mean, it is just, just one crazy thing after another in Israel. And uh, there, there's no stability. If you can think about kings changing that, that quickly. I mean, six months, one month, two years, five years. That's, those, are, those are very quick reigns for, for kings uh, and when you're changing leadership that often like that, it, it really messes with the stability of, of your country. And that's, that's where Israel sort of found themselves. Uh, so during, towards the end of, of Jeroboam's reign, Assyria, they, they took over, if you're looking at this map here, hopefully you can, you can read it, um, Assyria, which is way up to the to the northeast there on this map, um, they they take over Phoenicia, one of the kingdoms that's to the north of of Israel that uh, Amos had actually listed in chapters one and two, and uh, now all of a sudden Assyria, when they were not a threat to Israel before, they are now because now they border Israel where Phoenicia is. Uh, Assyria becomes this big, bad superpower very quickly, especially when uh, Tiglath-Pileser III came to reign in Assyria. Um, so they conquered Phoenicia, and all of a sudden they're bordering Israel. And we talked about, like, in the United States, Canada and Mexico is what we're bordered by. And we're not, you know, we're not worried about them coming and invading us. But for a nation like Israel, they always had to worry about who, who was on their border because uh, they were worried about, about war. Well, um, so uh, Assyria takes over Phoenicia. They, they're big, they're bad, they're scary. Uh, especially after Jeroboam is gone, Israel really starts to worry about Assyria. Uh, so if you, if you think about the time of Menahem, go down, go down those kings. So Jeroboam, Zechariah, Shalom, Menahem. Uh, Menahem, he gets really scared of Assyria, and he makes Israel a vassal kingdom to Assyria so that they won't come in and conquer Israel. So they basically become, uh, they pay tribute to Assyria so that Assyria won't come in and try to try to take them out. So uh, th this ha has all kinds of problems. They are absolutely indebted to Assyria. Uh, they have to send money and goods and, and other things to Assyria in order to keep that relationship good. Uh, and it, it's really a very scary place to be because, uh, I mean, Assyria could call in that debt whenever they wanted to, and if you don't have it or you don't send it, then, then you're in big trouble. Uh, not to mention that Assyria can enforce rules and laws on you that weren't necessarily your own, even including uh, different kinds of idol worship or, or worshiping of particular gods that were important in, in Assyria. So there's creates all kinds of issues uh, so they're, they're beholden to Assyria. Uh, and then, then uh, you've got Pekahiah, and then you've got Pekah. Well, Pekah, he gets really tired of being a vassal kingdom to Assyria. Um, it's created a lot of mess in Israel. So Pekah, he hooks up with Syria. They, he forms an alliance with Syria, which you can see uh, uh, is kind of Aram, that area between uh, in this map between Assyria and Israel to the northeast. So, uh, so they, they form a, an alliance, and they are going to try to go against Assyria together. Well, they decide that they're not quite power and powerful enough, even with their alliance, to be able to take on big, bad Assyria. So they then go down to Judah, and they try to enlist Judah to make an alliance with them also to go against Assyria. 
But Judah, Judah says, no, we're not stupid. We're not trying to go against Assyria. We don't want to make Assyria mad. Um, we don't want anything to do with this. So then uh, Pekah, Israel, and Syria, they get, they get super mad at Judah because Judah won't join in them. And so they start a war with Judah. They forget about Assyria for a minute, and they start this war with Judah because they're upset with Judah. Uh, this happens in about 735 B.C., and it becomes known as the syro ephraimatic War. So Syria and Ephraim, or Israel, together, they make this alliance and they fight against Judah, and it becomes known as the syro ephraimatic War. Well, Judah, they realize that they're not strong enough to fight uh, off both Israel and Syria at the same time. So they then go and ask Assyria for Assyria's help, and, and they make an alliance with Assyria. So now you've got Judah on one side of Israel and Syria, uh, Assyria on the other side that they're at war with. Um, Judah and Assyria are together. Judah, Judah, they make an alliance, but it's more of a, a, of a vassal kingdom kind of, kind of relationship. And so they put themselves in the same situation with Assyria that Israel had before, which is going to create all kinds of trouble for, for Judah as well. So, um, uh, I mean, this is, this is a, it is a time of crisis for Israel for, for a lot of reasons. They are in serious crisis mode. Um, going to see, uh, so, so two main areas of crisis in, in Israel during this time. Uh, one is, is their politics, their military, their kings, their money, uh, all, all this kind of stuff. Uh, you are going to see a lot of references in Hosea to uh, political type things, to military things, to, to uh, Assyria and Syria and, and all these different politics that they have going on. And, and it's, it's complete crisis mode. I mean, it is a scary place to be. Uh, and then the other crisis, big crisis in, in Hosea during this time is, is religion. Um, you, you're going to see Baal come up a lot in Hosea, uh, the worshiping of him, the worshiping of other gods and, and idols. Uh, you're going to see priests who aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. You're going to see people who don't even know that what they're doing is wrong, that it's not something that God likes, uh, it, which, is, which is, man, it's such an indictment on, on priests and on parents for not teaching their children uh, the ways of God. Uh, there, there's going to be some other things that overlap both of these categories, like the, like the treatment of poor, like we saw in Amos. That, that's one that goes to both politics and, and religion. They're, they're not really a, a separate deal in Israel. So, um, so we're going to see these crises play out in Hosea. He's going to address these a, a little bit. Um, ultimately, Hosea is very, very concerned with Israel's relationship with God, um, and what that relationship looks like, how Israel has, has spurned him. We're going to see two main analogies. The, the first one is, is husband and wife, and we see this play out in chapters 1 through 3 uh, when Hosea is asked to, to live out uh, what's happening between Israel and God in, in his own life. Um, and we have this analogy as God as the husband and, and Israel as the wife. Uh, and then also in chapter 11, we see this analogy with, with God as father and Israel as, as son. So this father-son type relationship, you know, sort of like, like Jesus spoke in parables. Uh, um, it takes these spiritual, heavenly kind, kind of things and, and describes them in terms that we can understand from our everyday life. Well, Hosea sort of does that with, uh, <coughs> with this analogy between uh, God and Israel as husband and wife and, and father's son. He, he talks about it in terms that, that we can understand. Um, uh, at the same time, sometimes that's a, a little bit difficult based on our own life experience for, for instance, um, uh, you know, there, there's probably some of us who don't have the best relationship with our, with our father. Um, 
And so, so this idea of God as Father is hard to grasp because we haven't really seen what it looks like to, uh, to have a, a loving Father. But um, you know, as Hosea makes these, these analogies, um, I think we'll see that he's really intending for like this idealized uh, Father is who God is, the, the loving Father, the compassionate Father, the merciful Father, the Father who pursues his children. Um, and the same with with a husband. Uh, so, uh, just um, something to think about there. Um, <coughs> there are there's three main sections in Hosea, uh, chapters one through three, chapters four through eleven, and chapters twelve through fourteen. Uh, chapters one through three, they're they're mostly a, kind of a narrative story. Uh, not not completely. In, in chapter two, there, there's some poetic kind of kind of places, um, but chapters one through three are really a a summary of of the whole book of of the whole book of Hosea. Uh, chapters four through eleven, there's going to be a, done, a bunch of indictments against Israel. Let me tell you why you're in the situation that you're in. These are the things that you're doing that are not okay. The things that you have been repetitively doing over and over and over again. Um, Chapter 4 through 10 is pretty much all indictments. And then chapter 11, the, the tone changes quite a bit. And God is, God is pursuing them. Uh, he's going after them. He's trying to bring them back. Even though their, their backs are turned to God, God's going to go after them and pursue them. Um, it's a very different kind of tone in chapter 11. And then chapters 12 through uh, 13, they're very similar to, to 4 through 10. Uh, some more indictments, some, some reasons for why they are where they are. And then chapter 14, the tone changes again, and God's going to try to bring them back and pursue them and have have compassion, have mercy, uh, uh, bring them back into his fold. So that's that's sort of the the outline of Hosea there. Why don't we go ahead and look in uh, in chapter 1. Let's let's begin in verse 2. Let's uh, let's go ahead and start there. (coughs) And uh, we'll... We'll see how far we get today. but um, So chapter 1, verses 2, 2 and 3. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim. She conceived and bore him a son. Uh, so a couple things here. You know, my version says whoredom. The the, the version that you're reading might might say something different. Um, uh, but um, obviously, we're we kind of know what we're talking about here. Um, this is a weird thing. This is a weird thing that happens here, where Hosea is being asked to to live out this human analogy of what the relationship between God and Israel has become, uh, that Israel has, in a sense, prostituted itself against God by running after other lovers, by, by putting other things ahead of God, by, by worshiping other idols, by worshiping other gods, by worshiping other things, by, um, and allowing those things to, to permeate their lives and, and change how they, how they do their everyday life even and how they treat people. <laughs> and um, Hosea is asked to, to live this out. Um, it's a really interesting deal. You know, it's not um, unheard of for prophets to be asked to do strange things like this, like, like Ezekiel was asked to do some very strange uh, living out kind of things that he was prophesying about. Um, so we don't really know what Gomer's situation was before Hosea decided to marry her. It sounds like she was probably already down this, this path, already in this place of um, uh, prostituting herself. Uh, um, I don't really know exactly, but it, it, and depending on which version you read, it might sound a little bit different. But the option is that she was probably already down that path. Uh, so... Um, Verses 4 through 5. The Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood 
of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. So call his name Jezreel, Valley of Jezreel. I don't know if that, if that recalls anything for you, but um, this is one of those historical references in, in Hosea. There's several things that happened in the Valley of Jezreel. None of them were good. So uh, there was a huge, huge massacre of Baal worshipers in the Valley of Jezreel. They were completely and totally wiped out. Um, <coughs> there's a woman whose name sounds a little bit like Jezreel, uh, Jezebel, and uh, she, she did all sorts of crazy stuff, but um, she died a very cruel death. Guess where? The Valley of Jezreel. Uh, Jehu, who's mentioned here in, in 4 and 5, he murdered the kings of Israel and Judah in the Valley of Jezreel and, and murdered seven sons of King Ahaz. Um, if you're thinking about Valley of Jezreel, just from those three things, all of a sudden you're thinking that this is, this is a place I don't really want to be. I don't want to be in the Valley of Jezreel. Well, you're right. It's a, the, the picture that we get is there, there's a lot of death that happens there. And um, I, I think this is what Hosea is wanting us to get, this, this picture of, of death. Jezreel is this uh, metaphor to, to say that Israel is it's on its way to death. It's on its way to death. Um, so uh, you, you also see here the, the kings of Israel are, are going to be no more. They're going to go by the wayside. The, the house of Jehu, the, the last two kings from the house of Jehu were Jeroboam II and Zechariah. And when Zechariah is assassinated, um, there's a new family that, that comes to uh, kingship over Israel. So Jehu's house is, is punished. Um, Israel, uh, he's, his house no longer gets to be king over Israel. And that plays out in, in uh, Second Kings as you're reading through. <coughs> Verses 6 through 9. Uh, she conceived again and bore a daughter. The Lord said to him, Call her no mercy. For I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. But I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. And when she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the son said, Call his name not my people, for you're not my people, and I am not your God. Um, so no more mercy. <laughs> That's not a good place to be. I mean, that's, that's really the only reason that, that Israel, uh, that anybody has existed up to this point is because of, because of God's mercy. I mean, you think even all the way back to, to the Exodus and they're, they're, coming out of, they're coming out of Egypt and, and um, they, uh, Moses has to talk God into going with them after the whole golden calf deal. I mean, uh, God has mercy. He has mercy. Um, and here, he says, no more. No more. And then, not my people. You're not my people anymore. It's a reversal of, of the beginning of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. He says, no more. No more. And, and as we keep reading, it's not that, that God doesn't want them to be his people, um, but it's that they, they don't want God to be their God. They've turned their backs on him. And uh, when you turn your back on God, he, he lets you, as we, as we see here. And it puts, puts people in some very, very bad places. Um, not that God isn't going to then try to pursue you and bring you back. Verses 10 through 11, a little bit of a different tone. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of all Israel shall be gathered together and they shall appoint for themselves one head and they shall go up from the land for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Um, so God's covenant people are going to continue. He's going to pursue them. The place where they were called not my people, they will be called children 
of the living God. Um, there's going to be redemption. There's going to be restoration. There's going to be uh, a lot of doom and gloom, but it still ends in hope. Hosea always ends there. Uh, God's going to redeem. He's going to continue to love. He's not going to forget them forever. Uh, you see Jezreel here, again, talked about in, in a positive sense this time, which is interesting because before Jezreel uh, brought about this image of death, well, the, the word Jezreel in Hebrew, it actually means God will sow. So we get this image here of this barren land and then God sowing uh, seed and bringing about new life in a place where there, where there was none. So there's death, but then there's new life that comes from it. We'll see, we'll see Jezreel referred to like that again. So, so here, it's a positive sense, and God is, is bringing about new life from, from this death that's happening. Uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Let's, let's read some of this together and then talk about it. <coughs> Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters you have received mercy. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. That she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. Um, uh, here, the, the mother is, um, is the, the wife of God. It's Israel. Israel is, is the mother here, and... Um, He's talking about, again, like uh, talking about Israel and him uh, as if they were in like this marriage relationship kind of, kind of deal. Uh, so that's when, when you see mother there, that's, it's referring to Israel. Verse 3, lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born, make her like a wilderness, make her like a parched land, kill her with thirst upon her children. Also, I will have no mercy because they're children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Now that's an interesting statement there because uh, we'll see this is a, a big indictment in, in Hosea of Israel is that um, Israel takes the things that God has given them, the gifts that come from God, the things that he has lavished on them, all those good things, and they don't realize that those things come from God, and they take them all and they give them to Baal. They give them to other idols. Uh, and so these things that, that are from God are then taken and given to these lifeless statues, and God's not happy with that. Therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns. I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her path. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. She shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. There's what I was talking about right there. Um, she, she didn't know it was me who, who gave her all of those things. And that's, uh, that's man, they, they don't know. They don't have knowledge of God. We'll talk about knowledge of God here in a little bit too. Um, so she's going to pursue her lovers but not overtake them. Uh, the lovers that, that are being talked about here, of course, are... are um, idols and Baal and other gods who they're, they're worshiping, who they're um, doing their lives on behalf of or, or for. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're going to pursue an idol made out of wood, eventually you're going to find out that it's not talking back to you, right? Um, so uh, God says that's, that's going to happen at some point. You're going to realize that these idols you're worshiping, they, they can't do anything for you because they're, they're just wood. They're, they're not anything better than that. Uh, uh, Miguel in, in class um, uh, on Wednesday, he, he pointed out Psalm 135 and, and David talking about these, um, these lifeless idols. They can't speak, they can't talk, they can't, they, they're, they're nothing. And uh, at some point, hopefully, people will realize that they're nothing. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I went to... 
uh, I took a, a religion class one time. And as part of that class, I was required to visit a Hindu temple. And uh, you walk in, you have to take off your shoes, uh, and uh, the, the smell of incense is so, so strong, so, so strong. I, I, can't, I can't stand incense to, to this day because of, I associate it with this experience in the, in the Hindu temple. But you, you walk into the room, and um, several things that you see. First, first you notice that there's, there's statues up all, all around the room of all these different um, idols that are, that are worshipped as, as gods. Um, in the middle of the room, there, was, uh, there were a couple of different priests, and they were uh, uh, offering sacrifices on behalf of people. There, I know there was fruit on one of them. I, I couldn't see what was on the other, but, but people were literally offering, um, offering fruit as a sacrifice, and it was being burned uh, with the aroma going up to, uh, to the idols around the room. Um, in front of the idols, some of them, there were people laying completely and totally prostrate on the floor, uh, just flat on their faces with their arms up above their head in front of these statues. Um, and, uh, I mean, this isn't exactly what it would have looked like here in Hosea, but it, but it sure reminds me of that, these, <coughs> these just lifeless statues that, that people are expending their lives on behalf of. Um, and uh, this, is, this is going on here. So let's talk about Baal just for a minute. Um, so you're going to see Baal mentioned a lot. Baal was uh, a Canaanite god. So when um, Israel crossed over into the Promised Land into Canaan, uh, it, the Baal was worshipped there. It was a, a Canaanite god. He was believed to have been a, a fertility god, god of the harvest, he, he might have been called. Um, so the, the idea was that if you were good with Baal and good standing, then you'd have a really good harvest and your people wouldn't die from starvation. But if you weren't good with Baal, then the rains wouldn't come at the right time, the sun wouldn't come at the right time, all the crops would die, maybe there'd be a locust plague, they would come and kill the crops, or just something would happen to the harvest. And then it would be very, very hard for your people because they, they wouldn't have food stored up and they'd be starving, basically. Um, so uh, they believed that, this looked a little bit different at different points in time, but basically uh, they believed that when the harvest ended, Baal would then descend under the earth and he would be in the underworld for a little while. And if in the underworld he met his lover and, um, and they consummated that with each other, then Baal would then rise back up and he would be lord of the harvest and everything would be great and wonderful. Uh, but if he did not meet his lover in the underworld and consummate that, then the harvest would be, would be bad. So... Uh, in order for Baal to meet his lover, people believed that, that two things had to happen. One was the offering of, of sacrifices, all sorts of different sacrifices that they would come and bring to Baal. Uh, so you see high places mentioned quite a bit. They would go to the high places and offer these sacrifices to Baal. Um, but then also, at these high places, there were actually uh, Baal cult prostitutes, um, people who would, who would be there at these high places. So people would go and, and offer their sacrifice, and then they would sleep with the cult prostitutes. And if both of these things happened with enough people and uh, often enough, then it was believed that Baal would be happy and he would meet his lover in the underworld, but it required sacrifices and um, uh, relations between Baal cult prostitutes in order for him to meet his lover and for things to be good. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll actually see uh, a similar sort of thing with, with Asherah or Asherah poles. Um, uh, similar beliefs with, with Asherah. Um, uh, actually mentioned more than Baal in scripture even, but they often go hand in hand. So if there's Baal worship, then there's probably worship of, of Asherah happening as well. Um, so 
uh, this is a little bit of what, of what Baal worship looked like. And, and you can understand why God's saying, you're, you're prostituting yourself against me. You're, you're running after other lovers. You're going after these Baals that, that don't even exist. You're, you're giving yourselves over to these false things that are never going to do anything. And not just that, you're taking the things that I've given you and giving them to Baal. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a scary thing. And, and really, for we see in Hosea, worship of God and Baal and Israel have become so intertwined that people don't even know the difference anymore. We talked about, about syncretism and sort of the combining of two religions. Well, that's, that's what's happening here in Israel. Uh, they, are, they are combining the worship of God and of Baal. And it's happening at high places. It's happening at places like Bethel and Gilgal and um, uh, Dan, where there's, where there's temples and, and places of worship there. You know, there's <clears throat> people who are worshiping God, but, but, then, but then there's like the golden calves in there that they're also worshiping. And um, there's just this, like, like people just don't, they don't even know anymore. They don't know anymore. They're not listening. Uh, if you, we, we talked in class here, uh, Jeremy had asked a question about um, how, how in the world like people come to these beliefs in, in um, false idols and false gods. Like how do they, how do they end up there? Like how, how do they come up with this stuff? Um, I, I won't go into that now, but, there, but there's a video that I, that I really highly recommend. Um, it's, uh, it's by a, a guy named Rob, Rob Bell, R-O-B-B-E-L-L. Uh, and it's called, The Gods Aren't Angry. The Gods Aren't Angry. Uh, if you have some time, it's about an hour and a half long. It's, it's kind of long. Um, but, uh, but he sort of, he, he gives a very good picture of how, how this sort of developed over time, how it might have developed, what people would have been thinking, what they would have noticed, how they, how they end up in a place where they're worshiping something like Baal, or, or even worse, like a god like Molech, where they're, they're offering their, their firstborn child as a sacrifice to, to worship the god Molech. Um, he actually surmises, and there, there's some, some others who, who do so as well, that, that one of the things that was going on in... Uh, in Genesis, when God asked Abraham to go uh, take Isaac up, up the hill and to, to offer him as a sacrifice, there's some who surmise that um, that that's, would have been like a normal religious practice for Abraham from, from where he came from, from Ur, um, that, that that's a would have been a normal practice, child sacrifice, and so that Abraham probably wouldn't have been surprised by that. Uh, so, you know, Abraham, obviously, he proves faithful and he goes and does it. But, um, but there's some who surmise that God asked him to do that because he wanted him to, in a very, very real way, understand that I am not that kind of God. This God, the real God, the true God, he is the one who provides the sacrifice. Not you. I'm not asking for you to sacrifice your children for me. That is a practice that we will not continue in this covenant relationship that we have. So, uh, and you see that again, of course, played out with Jesus where God provides a sacrifice. There's nothing that we can do. Um, not, we can't sacrifice enough. It took God providing the sacrifice. Um, so, there's some who, who think that's what was going on there with, with Abraham was combating this, this, these other religious practices that were um, just, just so um, uh, could, could require your child as a sacrifice. And God says, that's not the kind of God I am. Um, but um, no, a really good video. So if you have a chance to, to find it and, and watch it, um, just look up Rob Bell, The Gods Aren't Angry. Uh, pretty good. Um, so, uh, let's, uh, I think that's about where we ended in class on, uh, on Wednesday. So I will go ahead and stop there and we will finish up Hosea next week. 
The sound will be better, I hope, uh, Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock, so join us then. Um, and uh, if you haven't read Hosea, go ahead and read through that. Uh, hopefully everybody's receiving um, my, my emails with uh, the different homework assignments and, and such in them. Uh, please do remember to, to turn those in to me through, through email. I mean, if you're behind, it's okay. Just get caught up, get them turned in. Um, it's all good. Uh, and um, uh, so, so if you haven't read Hosea, read it, and then we will also begin Micah next week. So uh, read through Hosea, read through Micah, so they're, they're fresh on your mind as we're, as we're going through class. Uh, thank you for watching again. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I really, really hate to um, add more time into your day. I know you're all very, very busy and uh, thankful for the the things that you're giving up in order to be a, a part of this class. Um, so uh, look forward to, to next week and digging into Hosea more. Have a good evening.